And we're here with Logan Mullen. Logan, what is up? Not a whole lot, Evan. How about you? <laughs> not, My voice not is much. already going out. I don't know what that's about. Yeah. <laughs> um, good to have you on. This is your third time in the past like two months. This is the third time. I'm, I'm ready there. to start giving Connor a run for his money. <laughs> yeah. You you know you're you're fighting for that uh top spot on the on the first line I guess this point. Yeah, I guess so. I'm I'm David Krejci. I'm I if Connor was not in front of me, people would respect me more, but because Connor's in front of me and he's the Patrice Bergeron in this situation, not to gas him up too much, but Yeah, come on. Uh, yeah. I don't want to what, get I wonder what track. I wonder what I'm in this situation. I guess I'd be the head coach in a sense. Maybe. Uh you're Peter Solarik, just riding the coattails on the wing. <laughs> That's know, all that matters. And the other guys do all the work. <laughs> yes, I am. I guess I'm the Peter Solarik of uh, the Bruins media, which is <laughs> the tough thing to have. I had some guy going at me. I said, uh, I don't know if you saw this, Connor. I said Connor Clifton had a bad pinch on the first goal in the – Awful uh, pinch. No need for In the for Sunday it. night. Yeah, terrible yeah. pinch. And the guy responded something like, have you ever played the game before? I bet you've never even played a sport. So, of course, I have one career huddle highlight. I responded with that, obviously. I've been waiting yeah, to use wouldn't? it. And he, he gave maybe my favorite Twitter reply to me of all time. I'm pulling it up now. This is, honest to God, Logan, this might be the one of the funniest things I think I've ever gotten. He said, typical media hack, soft as dog poop, and never put a jock on. You guys bore the crap out of me. Go get another booster shot. He spelled instead of booster, he spelled it with an A. So okay. it was a successful reply in my book. By I haven't even got my first booster shot. I haven't either. So this yeah. guy, I, I, and I he don't says, even know I, if I'm eligible yet. I forget how that works. Yeah, I have no idea how it works. I'm just kind of rolling. At this point, I have no idea. I'm just rolling with it. But uh, anyway, speaking of things, we have no idea how they work. The schedule. The Bruins do not yes. play again until Saturday. It, yes. it, this is I, their bye week. Is their bye week? I, I saw someone tweet that they're going to get a bye week before the Patriots, which is incredible. Pretty um, much, yeah. Yeah, they get a bye week before the Patriots do. Is this their official bye week? No, I don't think so. Oh, is they're going to get time. Well, what do they get, well, get off the- around Thanksgiving? Because they play Black Friday in the afternoon. Do they? Yes. I always forget if they give them the Wednesday before Thanksgiving off. I, I think I think they play Wednesday and then Thanksgiving is off and then they're back Friday. I could be yes. wrong about that. No, I think I think you're correct on that. But uh, obviously they have time off at the end of the year for or middle of the year for the uh, the Winter Olympics. Yeah. But I figured with 13 games into the season, it's a good enough sample size, right, to kind of do a state of the of the union type thing. Sure. Um, and I it's funny one thing that stood out to me is a big question that I have with this Bruins team, and it's what are the Bruins? In past years, we've been able to look at the roster and say, okay, this is a top three team in the Atlantic. They're going to be a playoff shoe-in. They're a lock, right? Them, Toronto, Tampa, prior to that time, you know, there's that little weird stretch in the middle of the 2010s. Before that, it was, well, they're a playoff lock. So they were. All, they had, you knew the roster. You knew it was right. solid. You knew they were going to be in the playoffs. But I'm looking at these. I, I Before we got on, uh, I looked at the record. They're 8-5, and five, which is good. That's correct. Good record. Yep. Not, not a terrible record. Um, their wins so far, Dallas, Buffalo, San Jose, they beat Florida in a shootout, Detroit, Ottawa, New Jersey, Montreal losses, Philadelphia, Florida, Carolina, Toronto, Edmonton. I think the all very good teams, (laughs) all very good teams. So this is my point. I think the wins they've gotten and the losses they've gotten show where they are in the league. They're a middle of the pack team. Would you agree? Yes, I, I would agree with that. I think they are akin to what I don't know let's say the Florida Panthers were the last few years before they really took the next step where you knew they were like good they had some fatal flaws but they were constantly lurking they were hard to beat and they were in the playoff hunt pretty much wire to wire but it was a coin flip whether or not they were going to get in uh, now, more often than not, those Panthers teams did not get in, <laughs> but I, it, which I would not – push comes to shove. I think the Bruins are a playoff team. Okay, I okay. think that they are probably not a, a runaway favorite by any stretch. I think they would – with the Maple Leafs rebounding and being good now, I'd say the Bruins are firmly a wild card team, uh, oh, yeah. which is probably a lower expectation than what you would want for them, but – from what I've seen so far, there's not a whole lot to that would make me think that they should miss the playoffs, but there's not a whole lot to make me believe that they will 
hang around with the the Lightning and the Panthers and the Maple Leafs. Like I, I think that they are a pretty firmly in the wild card mix at this point. Yeah, I also think like when you look at the roster, um, you know, you look at the goaltending. Is it better or worse than last year? Probably worse. Jugarask is better than both of those guys. I mean, it's not yep. to say Swayman's Swayman's been good. Omar could have been, could be better, um, but he's been fine. Uh, but they have Rask not lost is, because of Omar. Correct. This is one hundred percent correct. In that Edmonton game on Thursday, we were both there. We both said this isn't on Omar. This is not yeah. like this. You know, he wasn't. He didn't steal you it, but he wasn't the reason you lost. You know, he was sure. he was fine. I would I would say he's been like slightly above average this year, just slightly. Yeah. Not great, but slightly above average. Um, maybe that's being a little generous. But anyways, I do think, though, that you look at the roster goaltending better the past few years. D- yep. Defensively, I mean, last year's decor wasn't amazing. You got the addition of Mike Riley last year, who looked a lot better uh, at the end of the year last year than he has so far this year. We'll get to Riley and Saboral later yep. on in this episode. But are they better defensively than last year? Uh, I don't know. Probably a I, push. like I think there's it's I would guess it's easy to have some revisionist history on that defense last year because Mike Riley went and rejuvenated them and was pushing guys out of the lineup. Um, but I mean, that there were question marks on that defense all year. A lot of it was due to injury too, right? Like it, it oh, did yeah. not take long for Jared Tenorti to be playing 18 minutes a night. Which he's, he's, I think he's currently, I could be wrong on this, but last I checked, he was playing consistent minutes for the Rangers. Cause that, that would like, surprise me. Tom Wilson broke that franchise. They're right. like, oh, and so they man, got we got Tenorti and Reeves, Reeves. and Goodrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just went out and got all the big guys. But I, I just, even not just last year, cause last year's defense was, was rough, but even just years before that, right? Teams that were consistent playoff teams, this is, this defense is worse. That's not, not close to past yeah. years offensively you don't have Krejci like you don't yeah. have Krejci I've said all offseason you know again depth will carry this team and I do believe that at some point you know Felino, Hala, uh, Nosek those guys are going to score more uh, you know Frederick or not Frederick Felino hit the post the other night and he's had chances he got killed on that McAvoy goal yeah he got he sure did. run over uh, and obviously you know Hala had a goal the other night and Nosek's going to finally get one but even then though the depth Depth can't compare to Krejci. You, you know, that that's that's not yeah. making up for 70 points. So it, it makes me wonder, and it, and you, I think, agree with this. It's the middle of the pack team, you know? And I don't think – I think they're going to have hot stretches of the year. But I don't see this team being one that finishes first or second or even maybe third for that matter. Well, I think the thing that separates where they are now versus the teams that they used to be – and the crazy example is kind of underscores this is the Bruins used to be so good because they had guys playing in roles lower than what they were capable of. Like they were so loaded with depth that like Charlie Coyle, he can play on the second line. He's way better on the third line. And so then you get the softer matchups and things like that. And I mean, even Tory Krug on the second defensive pairing like he wasn't the greatest defensive player got better as time went on but he was by having him there it allowed you know guys who you could argue were second pairing caliber defensemen playing on third pairings like Matt Grizzlick now they've kind of lost that and there are teams that survive with guys firmly situated in roles that are probably best tailored towards what they belong in but I think what separates the good teams from the great teams are the great teams are ones that have guys playing in roles beneath what they're capable of. That's what the 2019 Bruins by and large were able to do. Um, You know, that's what the lightning have been able to do for a while. I mean, Blake Coleman was a top and second line winger for the devils before he ended up with the lightning. He was playing on the third line. Um, you know, so things like that. And I think that's ultimately what puts them to agree with you firmly in the middle of the pack is they're not bad. They have guys right where they should be. They don't have guys playing up, right? Like Sean mm-hmm. Corrales centering the third line for the Blue Jackets right now, and the Blue Jackets do absolutely nothing for me. Um, but I think that's why the Bruins right now, this is kind of their lot in life. And I think that eight and five record is probably fair for where they should be. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And again, I, I it's funny. You, you made a great point with the playing in roles lower than they are normally are. Because you're right, Coyle, Krug, Grizzlick. Uh Mike Riley is probably a he's third a third pairing guy. To defenseman on a, a, yep. a cup team. Um, and you can go down the line of, of I mean, Nick Craig Kalina, Smith. Craig Smith's in Craig, Craig Smith is you know on a really good team, probably a third liner. You're right. Yep. Um, but he's up on the second coils up on the second. And it's not to say these guys can't play these positions. They can, but again, it's not your, as you said, I mean, remember 2019, like that coil line was so great because yeah. they played other teams, fourth lines because the matchups right. worked that way. And, and, and coil and Johansson and Heinen were, you know, better than the guys they were playing against. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, it's again, it's early. And they also, if they make a move, which I don't know what pieces they'll move, but that'll probably be something we talk about much later in the year. But if they did somehow make a big move, then it's different, right? Like last year's team, I was writing off before the deadline. They were not great. After Tahoe, they just went down. Um, They had a lot of injuries. I remember thinking, well, you know, don't spend a ton on this team. You know, they're probably not getting far. And then they go out, they get Taylor Hall for nothing. They get Mike Riley for nothing. And they're a completely rejuvenated team. And they went into the playoffs hotter than anybody. So they could go out and make a move. I don't know what that move will be. Cause you're probably gonna have to give up a lot to get someone impactful. I don't think you're going to have a Taylor hall situation around the league. Right. I also don't think you need a winger. I think you, you need a center and well, maybe not a center, but you need one to two defensemen. Um, and that's going to yeah. be very hard to come by at the deadline. So I don't know. Again, that's for another time, but yeah, I just, I know it's very early to be saying that a team is not a playoff shoe in. And I know this might get thrown back in my face later, but I was thinking about it and I was like, wait, they, they beat the bad teams. And they lost to the really good teams. Well, that makes them right in the middle. So, uh, in the win against Montreal on Sunday night, it was Charlie night. Just Charlie's was Charlie scoring. Night. It was Charlie night. I loved Connor's tweet of, uh, you know, Charlie Moore trying to get on the ice. <laughs> Log a goal. <laughs> Charlie um, Moore signs my checks, okay? So, yes, we're this not is true. No, I'm a, I, we stand Charlie Moore. We stand Charlie Moore. Um, but anyways, uh, Coyle scoring a goal. I know he scored one off his head, but he had a really nice, uh, his second goal was awesome. Yeah. Came in, lifted the stick, went in, put it top corner. McAvoy had two really good goals. And I think the encouraging thing about this is it's people other than the top line scoring goals, yeah. which is what this team needs, right? We've said all off season, we've said it now, depth is going to be what kind of carries this team. That's what's going to separate it. That's what's going to make it a good team. Um, what do you see with that middle six? Do you see signs that they are coming out and, and starting to sco- to get some better chances? I'll say yes, because it's also relatively incomplete, too. Like, I mean, they their lines make of them what you will the last few games because their third and fourth lines were basically interchangeable with injuries. But, like, that second line isn't entirely the group they wanted to roll with. Um, the fact that they're getting any sort of life from – contributors other than Patrice Bergeron, Brad Marchand, and David Pasternak is encouraging. At the same time, I think Charlie McAvoy is on like a 70-point pace, so at what point do you consider him <laughs> a secondary scorer versus a primary right. scorer? Like he, We're getting to the point where you almost expect him to be a a near point-per-game player, like you know, a three-quarters of a point-per-game player. The fact that Charlie Coyle is scoring, I think, is very promising because Taylor Hall will eventually break through. Craig Smith, when he's healthy, will eventually break through. Guy throws so many pucks at the net. I mean, raw right. averages. A puck is going to go exactly. in. Exactly. <laughs> the Charlie Coyle thing is, it's just nice to see him be assertive. That's more so what I look for with Charlie Coyle than every than anything, and that's what would get on my nerves watching David Krejci is like. He had a good shot when he was willing to use it. It was good. And I, if I were a Bruins fan, my biggest worry with Coyle would be, is he too much of a pass first player? And does he try and defer to his line mates a little bit too much? And I think Taylor Hall being such a good guy at driving play could sort of make Coyle be a little bit more docile, I guess, for the lack of a better term, but Coyle more so than McAvoy finding a way to, assert himself, create scoring, at least get near the net. I mean, the first goal was whatever. He was just right place at the right time, but that doesn't happen if you don't have a nose for the net, right? So Literally. 
<laughs> yeah, you literally <laughs> ate those for the net. And so that I wasn't even going for that. I, that one just came out. Um, so yeah, it's fine. I wouldn't say I'm about to make declarations that they have a, you know, electric middle six. I would need it to be a little bit more sustained, but it certainly doesn't hurt, especially when you see guys like Hall getting goals too, and uh, over the weekend as well. Yeah, it's funny. I, the coil stuff is interesting because, uh, for you know, for a while, it's all, the mo on him has been you know he doesn't play up to his potential. He plays so well, but he just doesn't produce. Now he's producing. So I right. think, and, and a lot of it seems sort of sustainable. And he's doing it with line. And we've said this, I think, before, where he's doing it with line mates who aren't producing as much uh, as yeah. with, as people would like them to produce. So that's a good thing. You mentioned the McAvoy thing. You mentioned the point. Uh, what he's on pace for. So while you, while you were talking, I did some math. I did Look some math. You. That's something I do not do very often. Most of us don't do it very often because we don't yeah, really need same. to. Um, but he is on pace for 75 points this year, which is nuts. Um, yeah. Which, I, again, is that going to happen? Probably not. Um, just given how like a season works, I would probably pencil him in conservatively around like 50 to 55 points which is very if good. he gets 75 points he should be a unanimous norris trophy oh winner. that's so that was my point was like if he's 75 points norris easily right he has the points yeah. he's got the five on five play because if like just watching him in that montreal game on on um on sunday and even some of these more recent games you see just how much he does and we've known this yeah. forever but a lot of these norris voters that's not their fault you're not watching every bruins game you know you're not watching you know, we don't watch every single Tampa Bay Lightning game or, or you know, many different games. But just the amount he does on yeah. the ice. I think also if I'm I, – I might be uh, wrong here, but it's, I think his goals for percentage on natural stature, I think he's fourth in the league among defensemen for goals for percentage. That. Yeah. And what's funny is I think the top two are Leafs defensemen. I forget which ones, though. Yeah, I think Rasmus like Morgan is, Riley. I don't think it was Morgan Riley. I forget who it was, but it was two different people. Um, but McAvoy has been dynamite. And I think, again, like you have McAvoy going at all cylinders go. You have Marshan going at all cylinders go. Uh, Poshnok will eventually find it. Bergeron playing really well. Like that's why I say this team's going to get hot at some point. They're going to go on a, an, you know, a, a seven or eight game win streak. People are going to throw the words I just said about 10 minutes ago back in my face. Um, yeah. But they, they, I feel like there is something there where they could be, be really good, especially with Coyle playing so well. So I would agree with that. The only problem is that you do need the secondary stuff to come around more because otherwise you're the Edmonton Oilers of the last few years, right? When they were playing McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Clefbaum. Like it is true. There is, there is, to there is no other more. good, ex- better example of like a team with like really high point producers that doesn't do well than the Oilers the past right. years. <laughs> and it was because the way they were playing wasn't sustainable. Like the teams that we've seen win the cup or make deep playoff runs – I don't know, especially the last five years or so, have been able to roll four very consistent lines. Not all huge point producers, but very consistent, reliable lines that had a clear identity. The Bruins don't have that right now. That's fine. It's 13 games into their season. They've dealt with a bunch of injuries. But I can see them getting hot for the same reason that they've gotten hot many times across the last few years because the first line and some of their top point producing defensemen just go bonkers and it all lines up at the same time. And then what happens, it comes to a screeching halt once teams adjust accordingly. So I don't doubt that this team will eventually get hot and people will be like, wow, look at these two, you know, chuckleheads who are saying that they (laughs) were going to be a middle of the pack team. But we have seen enough now where things all come crashing down and then a water eventually finds its level to be like, well, what really are they then? Um, and so I guess to kind of call back to what we were just talking about, yeah, I I think that the big time guys all going nuts at the same time is bound to happen eventually. But their actual identity as a team will be predicated on what the rest of the guys do. Hundred percent, and we and we both said this because we were both at Thursday night's game against the Oilers. We both said first line crushing it, fourth line shutting down the opposing top line, second and third lines. What do you got? And it's been the same thing that they've had for years now. So it, you know, I don't doubt that again that as you said, they're going to get hot at some point this yeah. year, right? They're going to have stretches. A couple. They're not just going to be one. Could be two, three, uh, where they're really good for extended periods of time. But they've done that the past 
four or five years too. Like it's the same yeah. thing. So that's why I think Bruins fans have to be a little cautious. Obviously it's good to get excited about your team. The passion helps people like us for sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, give it some time, wait a little bit to the playoffs to see really what you've got. Um, but who knows? I mean, they could really get a real identity. A third line could take shape, which hasn't happened around here since like, well, 2019 with the deadline. But yeah. before then, I mean, it was a long time to a legit third line. You had a great tweet today or Monday. Thank you. I, I have great tweets every day. Great tweets all the time. But this one was one that I really enjoyed uh, because Spoke Z had tweeted out uh, the uh, thing about the time Kevin Hayes wrote framing him and Alston when asked what the first two battles of the Revolutionary War were. You were like, people forget the shot heard around the world actually it was just a green line catenary wire sparking as a train rolled into Packard's corner. I said, damn, that is that is good. Yeah. I was going to quote it I with a Framingham reference. I was going to quote it with a Framingham reference, like Spoke Z's initial tweet. And I was like, only like, 0.05% of my followers will like get the reference. So like it's really not even worth making the reference. I honestly forgot that that happened. The Kevin Hayes thing. Was he joking? I don't remember. Again, this was like a part I of, remember. I feel like this was the, I feel like this was a part of COVID and quarantine that we all just like blacked out of our memory. Right. Yeah. Like, and we were all just so like beaten down and defeated. They're like, Hey, you can watch a, a zoom call with Keith Mandel, <laughs> Kevin Hayes, Chris Wagner, and Chris Kreider. And it's like, We're like I would oh, rather we'll get into it. <laughs> I would rather lay in bed and cry for the third straight day. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was it's funny. Like thinking back to that, the Zoom happy hours and uh, remember the Zoom 2011 Bruins call. That was actually good though. I'll give yeah, it, I'll give, that give was credit where credit's due. That was good, and yeah. that could have never happened if there wasn't COVID. So maybe COVID happened just for that to take place. Maybe it's all <laughs> I'm worth not sure it if I can <laughs> get behind that take. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe that's a little bit of a wild take, but no, and that I don't remember exactly. Uh, if he was serious or not with that, but crazy take nonetheless. Yeah. Um, speak, speaking of takes though, you wrote today in Nesson.com that I Jakob yeah, Sh- I dropped the crazy before. He, he <laughs> crazy. One well, one of the, the first time you were on, you said John Moore should be playing more. And people were like, well, what? John I, Moore? I still agree with that. No, I, I, I actually don't disagree with that either. I think he, like at this point, what is, what do you have to lose? Like, I, I don't understand what you have to lose with John Moore. If, not um, to commandeer your show here, but I would like to float the John Moore take I gave to you on Thursday. Oh, yes. Give that. Give it. Yes, I think people, so it'll my, open up a new part of their brains. Okay. So my take after watching – so I'm not generally the type of person that thinks you have to see a specific player in person to fully understand how good they are. exception was Connor McDavid. I had never seen him play in yes. person before. And – watching him his speed is not done justice on television it just no, isn't. It isn't please continue isn't. to watch in essence so i can have a roof over my head but if the oilers ever go to town again go to the game because i was blown away by how fast he was so we're watching and sit up game. above sit up above like yes. don't yes. sit yes. by sit the glass the sit yes yeah, sit, like sit up in the balcony because you get you can see it develop right so I was sitting there watching poor Brandon Carlo get put in a blender and Derek oh, Forbert be about, I don't know, 10 yards back in full stride <laughs> behind Connor McDavid. Uh, and I was thinking, is there anybody who can keep up with this guy? Because Riley's not that fast. Clifton is quick, but he's not fast. Like the Bruins don't really have very fast defensemen. And then I thought, well, John Moore is the greatest skater, defensive skater in the organization. Bar none, no questions asked. That is where John Moore would come in handy, is when you deal with a team or a player in particular that has a ton of speed. I'm not saying his raw defensive skills would be able to put the clamps on Connor McDavid, but the Bruins were so easily overwhelmed by McDavid and the Oilers at large, their speed, that I was sitting there thinking, you can't possibly tell me that John Moore, for as good of a skater as he is, is a worse option at this point than Forbert or Clifton or anyone like that. So if the Bruins defy the odds, make us look like morons and make it to the cup final and Connor McDavid and the Oilers are there to meet them, I would hope, if I were a Bruins fan, that John Moore is playing because he is the only one that can keep pace with them from a pure skating standpoint. Yeah, so my first thought was like, you know, I, I don't love John Moore in his own zone. I don't think that's great. I don't love him breaking the puck out. But then it's like, well, what do you have now that would – like who who is faster than him that is 
right. or who is not as fast, but way better at breaking the puck out who you would take out of the lineup. And it's like, well, I don't know. Mike Riley hasn't been great at breaking the puck out and great in his own zone. And you can go through the whole list there. And I don't think that's a crazy idea. I think that's an interesting one. Um, but you wrote today that Jakob Zaborl should stay in the lineup. I think a lot of people, I think he's, he's surprised a lot of people. And also Cassidy has been a huge fan of Zaborl yeah. so far. Cassidy loved uh, Zaborl after the New Jersey win um, saying he was a true pro. He was ready to go in, did a good job. And then Sunday night, he has a, Pretty solid game. Had one really bad play, which yeah. again with the step up on the um uh was it it was their second goal that he stepped up on, completely missed. Completely missed. Yeah, uh, was that hit. Armea? Was that the Armea goal? I, I feel like that was Armea on that goal. Or no, um, the guy whose last name begins with a P. Oh geez. You're gonna I'm get gonna me on this one. This, but yeah, I'm forgetting people are banging their car, like banging their like steering wheels right <laughs> it's now. Like Trezzy or this is but anyways, awful. You can look. Yeah, you 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 can, can look it up uh, on your own time. If you want to, Logan, go for it. Um, I'll let people kind of just sit in the in the in the uh, in the dark on this one. But I think Zaboral did have a solid game on Sunday. I don't think that was a a stretch to say. Uh, and it's funny, Connor Ryan actually made Michael Pizzetta. That's who Michael Pizzetta. I would Pizzetta. never have ever guessed that. So I'm glad you looked it up. Uh, Connor Ryan said something to me last year that I that stuck with me about Zaboral. And Zaboral is like a lineman. Right, so Boral's like a lineman. You don't notice him. You don't want to notice him. If he's yeah. doing his job, you will not notice him during a game. And I didn't really notice the Boral a hell of a lot on uh, Sunday night. And I think that's a good thing, right? Because we keep yeah. noticing Mike Riley get uh, get beat or turn the puck over. And I think Mike Riley will come out of it, right? Like I think Mike Riley will eventually, right. that, that's as you said, water it. find its level. And you're paying him too much to sit him, and he's yeah. a fresh new contract and such. Um, he also picked uh, Dancing on My Own. Uh, for his Bruins beat the other day. So, yeah. um, I mean, you know, now he's a real Bostonian. Yeah, uh, like but that. what what is your take on Zaboral? Well, so I ultimately took it a step further. I think they should try him with McAvoy. Because oh, that's right. That is what you said. You said McAvoy. Okay. So I thought Zaboral looked pretty good. He was not put in a great situation with Clifton because God bless Clifton, but he's gotten back to the place where he his game's gotten loud again, Clifton's. And unless you have a Lozon or a, a, a firefighter, basically, like Clifton can be a tough guy to play with. So I think Zaboro looked good in spite of that. And ultimately, my thing is he moves the puck well. Like his play on the McAvoy goal where he dump trucked Felino, that is incredibly underrated. That Zaboro danced through the neutral zone, avoided a hit with one hand on his stick, and then slipped a puck to Taylor Hall and basically sprung Hall. Um, that allowed for that rush, that chance. The two way ability has always been there for him. It's just been a matter of refining it. And he's playing a little bit edgier, it feels like this year. Like he's not as easy to move around. Um, and so I'm basically at the place where if you're not going to play Grizzly with McAvoy, which it just, for whatever reasons, it, it seems like it's not going to happen, or you should at least not bank on it happening consistently. Why not put Zaboral there? Because he is capable enough in both ends in the same way that Grizzly is like Forbert useless in the offensive zone. Doesn't tend to do a whole lot in the defensive zone. Like he's fine, but he's not great. But then, you know, what are your other options that you would put with McAvoy? Like, you can't just keep putting one-trick ponies with him. Like, they did that with Lozon. Like, Lozon was basically invisible offensively, but defensively he was fine. So Zaboral, I think, would take a lot of the pressure off of McAvoy to have to do basically everything in at least one area of the ice. Like, with pretty much every partner he has, minus Grizzly, that is the tendency that he has um, – is just by virtue of being a great player, he's the one that gets back on the pucks. He's the one that has to shoot. I think that if you put a true two-way defenseman of which Zaboral and Grizzly are the top two legit two-way defensemen that they have, then outside of McAvoy, that is, then it would at least allow for <laughs> Logan McAvoy. Mullen thinks uh, Jacob Zaboral is better than uh, Charlie McAvoy. Yeah, I didn't want that one getting Sorry, isolated and taken out of context. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I think Jakob Zaboral is better <laughs> than Charlie McAvoy. <laughs> um, but it allows him to, it allows McAvoy to play a little bit more freely. That is the overarching point is 
with everything right now, especially with Forbert, like he has to do all the heavy lifting in at least one zone. The objective when you put a guy with McAvoy should be, how is he going to free up McAvoy the most to be very, very good? And I think Zaboral of their options probably presents that uh, close to as well as Grizzly. See, isolated, I, I don't like that idea, right? You don't want a guy like Zavoral sure. there. But, but when you consider the other options, right? Obviously, Grizzlick and McAvoy is the best pairing you could possibly have. But you need Grizzlick to kind of balance things elsewhere. Yeah. The more I look at it, the more I think, hmm, that's interesting. And the more I think, if they do that, I would hope Cassidy doesn't do the trigger finger thing where he puts them together for a few shifts and takes them off. Like, yeah. do it for like three to four games. Give the... give. So borrow some confidence. See what you got. Like the guy's 13th overall pick. He I, back in the day, he was kind of projected to go in that area. The stretch yeah. was Seneshin, not defending the pick, but and he, I, do. I mean, he played and at times outplayed Shabbat. I think it was in, in juniors. Yes, he might, he might have. I mean, that's so far. Yeah, past that's what, point. Six but, years ago now. <laughs> yes. But I do think like, again, it's worth a shot. Like, why not give that a shot? Um, and again, he's looked good through two games. You might have something there. That yeah, could be your little boost. Yeah, and, and you're right, and I should clarify that, like, in an ideal world, Jakob Zaboro, this goes back to guys playing above roles they should be in, right? Like, yep. in an ideal world, Zaboro's on your third pairing. The way the roster's constructed right now, you are going to be stringing together and piecing together some defensive pairings. It shouldn't be the one with McAvoy. So you need to find the guy that's the best fit with them and then go from there. If they don't think it's going to be Grizzly, they should at least try Zaboral. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not completely against it because, again, what else is working? Like, do you want Forbert and McAvoy together the whole year? No. Forbert, again, Forbert's another one who on a good team is a third-pairing defenseman, right. right? Like, that's another example of someone who's playing above their role. And – you know, is he, is he, you know, fine at it? Sure. But if you're a really good team, he's a third pairing guy, you know? Yeah. And again, maybe he grows into it. That's another first round pick, by the way. Forbert was first round That's pick. Right. So, Wasn't he a high pick too? Uh, yeah, I don't think he, I forget where he was uh, in that draft, but he was yeah, up I think there. He was I want like to say like 14. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I don't know why I'm thinking he was a top 10 pick. But you, you might honestly be right. I'm looking it up right now. I guess we 15. we always it was 15th 15. and 20. I was close. I was close. We so right close. in the middle of the first. That's a legit. That's a legit first rounder, though. Um, yeah. But I, yeah, I know. I, 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 I sure. That is yeah, a legit maybe. first round pick. But <laughs> it's a real fact. You are correct. But. <laughs> I am correct. <laughs> Look at that. Um, but anyways, Connor. Uh, not Connor. Oh. My God. <laughs> Oh, oh boy. <laughs> oh that's, man, that's, that's getting stopped. clipped. <laughs> that's getting clipped. Um, that is just from getting used to outros and doing the same outro every time. Uh, but Logan, Logan, uh, what can the people look forward to from you over at Nesson.com? Well, that Jakob Zaboral story, of course. Damn right. And uh, <laughs> otherwise, the, uh, the Nesson Bruins podcast, which we will record tomorrow. But, you know, find everything we can to write about over the next few days. But there's nothing going on because the Bruins don't play again until Saturday. So come to Nesson.com slash Bruins. But I can't promise that there's going to be a ton there until <laughs> stuff starts happening. I'll, be I'll continue stuff. firing off some oral takes. I'll just re time stamp it every day and re promote it. <laughs> just change the authoring info. Oh, yeah. look, I published another support. I, I found more stuff. Um, but no, there's still some practice stuff coming. And obviously, Bruins, uh, the, the Bruins podcast you guys do comes out. It comes out Tuesdays, correct? I know you Tuesday said nights, usually. Yeah. Tuesday nights. So you can listen either Wednesday morning or Tuesday night. You know, pick it. Pick what you want, when you want to listen. It'll, it'll to be there. <laughs> It'll be, it'll be there. It'll be there no matter what. Uh, Logan, again, thank you so much uh, for joining. Uh, for Us Media, I'm Evan Marinovsky. You, Bruce, be listeners. Have a great rest. After week.